the ascension of Christ. Luke, in the end of the Gospel of Luke, and also the first 11 verses of the book of Acts, being the same author, he gives us a visual glimpse at the ascension of Christ. No other writer does that. Uh, other writers give us the words of Christ before His ascension. Matthew 28, the commission there to go and make disciples of all nations. Mark 16, uh, Luke. Uh, but, but Luke in particular gives us a visible uh, view, a glimpse of what the ascension looked like. He was taken up. He was lifted, lifted up off the earth. He went up, as the word means. And in Acts chapter 1, it says, clouds received Him likely symbolizing the Shekinah glory that's often depicted in the Old Testament through clouds, the cloud that hovered over the tabernacle, uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So now, as we've looked at the coronation of Christ last Sunday, His crowning, what happened when He went up into the heavens? And we saw just a small glimpse of that in Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible speaking of it in other places, but the writer of Hebrews tells us about the angelic host and some of the words that God Himself would speak concerning His Son when He said, Sit thou here at my right hand until I make thy foes, thine enemies, thy footstool. Psalm 110, verse 1. Now, as we began to look at last Sunday, the mission of Christ at the right hand of the Father. He sat down and we likened it last Sunday to that of an executive order. What is the first thing that Jesus did when He sat down or ten days after being seated there? The executive order, just an analogy, that He put in place is, of course, the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. And so today we'll look primarily at Acts chapter 2 and see in particular how does the promise of Pentecost apply to us today? What is it that we see in this chapter that will benefit us as it relates to the global mission that Jesus launched? He said it twice, Luke 24, Matthew 28, but Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. He said, wait for the promise. Wait till you're endued with power. In both texts. And then He said, you're going to receive power to be witnesses unto Me. In Luke 24, 49, or 48, He would say, beginning at Jerusalem and to the nations. In Acts chapter 4, he would say, Jerusalem, then to the south Judea, then to the north Samaria, if you think of that as a concentric circle, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Like dropping a rock in a lake, the rippling effect starting at Jerusalem, where the, the rock, so to speak, the gospel, was dropped, and it went out north and south, east and west, and it's rippled from that time until now. And it's had its rippling effect upon us as well. So let's look at the book of Acts and we'll see Pentecost is the promise that Jesus is referring to in Acts 1.4 and Luke 24 verse 49. And so we'll look at that chapter. In this chapter 2, the day of Pentecost has fully come. Pentecost means 50. It's 50 days after the Feast of the First Fruits. Pentecost is the Feast of Weeks, one of three yearly feasts that the males, representing the twelve tribes, would have to come into Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. Well, on this occasion, they had been scattered abroad from the Babylonian captivity, and they would come into Jerusalem, obviously bringing family and wives with them. So, so Jerusalem is teeming with people. There are people represented by twelve or more countries there. The Holy Spirit came. He gifted the people with the gift of speaking in tongues. Every man heard them speak in their own language. They had never learned the language. They had never studied the language. But simultaneously, as they they began to speak, they heard them in their own language. They were confounded. They were bewildered. Some asked, what meaneth this? Others said, mockingly, they are drunk with new wine. Then Peter explains. These are not drunken with new wine, as you suppose, it being but the third hour of the day. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. People may have a hangover, as it's called at that time, but they don't get drunk, typically, at 9 a.m. He first explains the prophecy of Joel, and what they're experiencing or seeing is according to that prophecy. Then he gives a three-point sermon. Crucifixion, he begins with. Him being delivered, that's Jesus, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and with wicked hands have crucified. 
but God raised him up. First point, crucifixion. Second point, God raised him from the dead. And then he quotes Psalm 16, which is a messianic psalm concerning the fact that Jesus' soul was not left in Hades or the grave. Then he moves to the ascension, the third point. David hath not ascended, he would say in Acts chapter 2, Peter would say. But David himself said this, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou here at my right hand, Psalm 110, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know, and this house as well, assuredly know that that same Jesus God hath made, that you crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. And then we pick up in verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced in their hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter then responded, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or forgiveness of sins, because or at, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in this verse, because the promise is unto you. The promise. So at Pentecost, the promise that came was the promise of the Holy Ghost, and this promise is the power of Luke 24, 49, and it is the power that they were to wait for in Acts 1, verse 4. Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem, essentially saying, don't do anything, so to speak, until you receive the promise. The disciples received the promise, and now Peter says, the promise is unto you. What promise? Well, he also confirms it in verse 33 of the same chapter, Acts chapter 2. Look at that verse. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He, that is Christ, He ascended, He sat down, and in that seated position, the first thing He does is shed forth this which you now see and hear. So the promise of power is the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ghost. It's the promise, Acts 1 4. Jesus said, You've heard from me. Now, when had the apostles in particular, he's talking to in Acts 1 4, when had they heard of this promise? Well, in John 14 through 16, you remember, Jesus identifies the coming Spirit as the Comforter. I will send the Comforter to you. The word Comforter is parakletos, root word is. Paraclete. Now, we usually think of comforter just as the word sounds comfort or consolation. And he is that, but there's something more to the word. The old English word, when it was translated into the KJV, means with strength. Or we could say with power. A paraclete in the Roman world was a family attorney. The word means to come alongside. You called for the family attorney and he or she would stand alongside of you and they would give you strength, aid, comfort. They would help you. And so Jesus takes this word, the Holy Spirit is the comforter, because when you're cast out of the synagogue, John 16, when they will kill you thinking they do God a service, when they will put you in prison, you will have the comforter. You will have the strength in a time of crisis. And so the gift of the Holy Spirit comes. He is the comforter. He's going to be the, their strength, their helper, their succorer. He's going to give them aid. He is the power. Now, who is the promise to? Verse 39. The promise is unto you. Now, Peter is speaking directly to all the Jews in Jerusalem. The promise is unto you. Secondly, the promise is unto your children. So now he's speaking to Jewish children, right? To you, that's the crowd. To your children, that's Jewish children. And then he says, to all that are afar off. Now, who would that be referring to? We are afar off geographically from Jerusalem, thousands of miles away. We are far off chronologically or in time from Jerusalem or this time period, over 2,000 years. But what Peter's saying is far off in ethnicity. Paul uses the same word in Ephesians 2.17 when he says, 
Jesus came and preached peace to you that were afar and you that were near. And in that context, it's very clear, the Gentiles, ethnos, the nations. And of course, that's who they're to be witnesses to. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world or the nations is the global mission that Jesus launched. Therefore, I conclude that the promise of the Holy Ghost is for you today. Because you're very far off in all of those three ways, but particularly the way Peter means is ethnically. You're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. And the gospel has come. The gospel and the new covenant embraces people out of the nations. Or, the important qualifier here that Paul uses, or Peter rather, what does he say? Even as many, just as many as the Lord our God shall call among you. How many was that? About 3,000. He called effectually and drew them. Peter called everybody indiscriminately. He didn't say, okay, if you 3,000 could kind of separate yourself from the other thousand, I'm just talking to you. Went out to the masses. God called 3,000 on that day. 3,000. To you, to your children who are effectually called. All that are effectually called. Among Jewish children and among Gentile children. And all, as many as the Lord our God shall call, among all nations. The gospel call is to be delivered to all men indiscriminately. But we don't make it effectual, beloved. God makes it effectual by the Spirit and the Word. And so they repent and receive the Word by which the Spirit illuminated them too. So clearly, this promise of Pentecost in some way is a promise for us today. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is it in particular? What can we see in this chapter that we are to claim as something of our own power and maybe things that are no longer with us. Well, the second word, not only the gift of the Holy Ghost, is in verse 41. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. And then, of course, 3,000 were added. And then we have the activity of this early church in Jerusalem. The word is gladly. See, the Holy Spirit brings gladness in the reception of The Word of God. The word gladness simply means with delight and pleasure, and it means to be satisfied. Now, when we use that word, we need to think of the word satisfied not as some uh, apex of some climactic emotional experience, but just think of the word rest. That's the imagery you should think about when you think about the word satisfied, because it means you have enough. You're just resting in something. That's what trust does. We're resting. We know that in Christ we have enough. And all that He is, He's always enough. And so to be satisfied, to be glad uh, in receiving the Word is to be receiving the Word about Christ because that's who Peter specifically speaks about in this sermon. You crucified Christ, God raised up Christ, and Christ has ascended to the right hand of the Father. So they received the message gladly about Christ. And that was the power of the Spirit unveiling Christ. How? Effectually through the Word of God. Not independent of it, but through the Word of Jesus Christ. Now, if there's a skeptic here and say, well, you know, you're just kind of focusing on a word there. I mean, how do I know that's the gift of the Spirit? Okay, they're glad. Can you prove it? Well, I hope so. John chapter 7, verse 37. Jesus is at the great feast, one of the three feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles. And while He's there, on the last day of that great feast, He stands up and He cries out and says these words, If any man thirst, let him come to Me and drink, as it is written, or he that believeth on Me, as it is written, out of his belly, just means his inner person or heart, shall flow rivers of living water. Parenthesis, verse 39. But this He spake of the Spirit, 
that those which believe, future tense, should receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. When was He glorified? His ascension. When was the Spirit given? Acts chapter 2. The promise of the Spirit came. What was the impact? Gladness. Gladness. Now let's think for a minute the difference in the work of the Spirit in the Old Covenant and the New. In the Old Covenant, the Spirit came and He left. In the New Covenant, Jesus said He'll abide with you forever. He won't go and come like He did. In the Old Covenant, you don't see the language of the Spirit like you do in the New Covenant. For example, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, preach in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, love in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit, cry out a Father by the Spirit, mortify sin by the Spirit, obey through the Spirit, don't quench the Spirit, don't lie to the Spirit, don't grieve the Spirit. None of that is in the Old Testament. Because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Beloved, you see more of Jesus Christ than Peter ever saw of Him face to face. Because Jesus said in John 16, there are many things I want to say to you, but you can't understand them. Until when? The Comforter comes. The Spirit of Pentecost What's He going to do? He's going to glorify me. How's He going to do that? With truth. Because the parakletos is the spirit of truth. And in that way, He has not yet been given. Now think of it this way. Let me illustrate illustrate it with a movie. Watched a movie one time of these two magicians who were in a fierce competition to find the greatest magic trick. And the setting was somewhere in the 1800s. Horse and buggy times. Well, one man appeared to have found a secret. Of course, appearing and disappearing or time travel. So what he would do on the stage, he put two cased openings and two doors about 20 feet apart. Nothing behind them, just space. You could see everything in between the two doors. He would stand in in front of one door bouncing a ball. He would open the door and bounce the ball toward the other door, 20 feet away, close the door behind him, and immediately appear in the other doorway and catch the ball before it went past. But by the end of the movie, it was revealed he had a twin brother. Now, you probably would have gotten that, but I, I couldn't get it. Now, at that moment, what you do is you rewind the movie and you start looking at scenes all through the movie. You can't not help but see that there's twin brothers then. The tension between different relationships that we've experienced. You can't watch the movie again and not know, hey, he has a twin brother. It's just the same with Christ. They had no idea what the Old Testament was saying. They knew someone was coming. They knew something about his work, but they had no idea until he ascended on high and finished his work and sat down and started a new work, a new stage in redemptive history. Now the Holy Spirit comes and illuminates them. The Spirit of truth. He guides them into all truth. And Jesus said, He will glorify me. You see more of Jesus than Peter ever saw of Him when He was on earth. And of course, Peter saw it too. Because it was through the Word about Christ's completed work that now we see the Old Testament and we are glad Because we see things they never could see. The work of the Holy Spirit is different today, beloved. In that He came. He's permanent. He came as the Spirit of truth. And He's here as the Spirit of truth to do what? To glorify Jesus Christ. So how does He glorify Christ in John 7? That they which believe would receive. They believe and receive Him in Acts chapter 2. He's glorified through believing the truth, resting in it, receiving it, being satisfied with the truth about Christ that the Holy Spirit has revealed. 
the full revelation now of all God wants you to know about His Son, you have access to, you have privy to, like no generation prior to Pentecost or Acts chapter 2. How are we using such a great and grand privilege? Are you glad? Do you see Jesus with great gladness? Secondly, not only did they believe the truth, Jesus gives an image, a figure, a word picture of what this experience would be about. And then we can obviously connect it to the word gladly in Acts 2.41. He said, if any man come to me, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth. Jesus is clearly talking about the work of the Spirit to unveil Christ through the truth in such a way that He's glorified when we come to Him thirsty thirsty and drink and we experience what? Satisfaction. What other word could you put there that Jesus wants you to insert in the blank? Now, there are a lot of synonyms you could use, but clearly when you drink water and you're really thirsty, thirsty, your soul, your thirst is quenched. That's the figure. Now, what is that word in Acts chapter 2? The Spirit came as a gift. They received the message of the Spirit through the Word, and they were gladly receiving the Word. Gladly receiving it. They were satisfied. Jesus was enough. Now think about that and what that means in terms of just trusting Jesus. Because the word picture, Jesus says, is a picture of believing. Our souls are experiencing something about Christ through the Holy Spirit that our souls are experiencing Jesus as enough. Or we could say rest. That's a synonym. Are you resting in Jesus? Is He enough? Let's think about that in a few ways in Acts chapter 2. They gladly received this revelation of Jesus and they trusted in God's provision for forgiveness. How did they do that? Peter said, repent and be baptized. How many people today want to receive the provision of forgiveness apart from repentance? It cannot be done. Acts 5.31, Peter said, Concerning Jesus, God has exalted Him to His right hand to be a prince and a savior, a ruler and a savior, for what reason? To give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Repentance answers to prince. Forgiveness answers to savior. And you don't get a savior without a prince. There is no forgiveness apart from repentance. They repented, pricked in their heart, They turned from sin, that's not a one-time turning, and they turned to the revelation of Jesus Christ through what? The Word. Gladly. Their gladness over Christ now was superior than the gladness they had over sin and rebellion. That's a struggle, but it's still what repentance is about. Secondly, they gladly trusted in God's pathway now for them, right? See, somebody says, well, I've repented, but they don't want a new pathway. They just don't, don't tell me about living a new pathway, see? But you do it all the time in life, don't you? If somebody wants to give you uh, guidance, career guidance, you, unless you just think they don't know what they're talking about, you generally receive it, you know? You prior students, you went to a guidance counselor, And she or he said, look, I would take this. This is the best route. If this is what you want to do to get there, for the most part, you said, okay. You received it. Financial guidance. How many here have not received financial guidance? If you've uh, contemplated retirement, said, well, put so much money here. I would play stocks here. Don't get too aggressive. Okay, you don't have much money. Let's get more aggressive. Whatever it is, if you trusted the counselor, you put your finances and your money on that pathway. Or on the pathway of the guidance. Now God says, I have exalted my son to be a king. And the pathway I'm calling you to trust and walk in is obedience. 
If you haven't started walking the pathway of obedience, you have not repented. Your lips may have said so. My lips may have said so. But until you start getting your life in line with what King Jesus says in His Word, you're not satisfied with King Jesus. I can say I am. But if my life is completely out of sync with the revelation that the Holy Spirit is given about King Jesus, how can I say, yeah, I'm satisfied with who He is and what He says. I'm just not really wanting to bring my life in conformity with that pathway. Yes, a thousand times yes, we lose our way. But we're talking about a commitment. We trust in the power to obey. Isn't that glorious? The Lord sent the Comforter to be a power unto obedience. In many ways, the Christian is like a hybrid car. If I could use that illustration. One that runs off gasoline, but could also run off of a battery. You know, when, when the fuel uh, runs out, it'll kick in, I suppose. I don't, I don't know much about them, but I think the battery kicks in and you run on battery. See? You, as a believer, can and should be and are fueled by the Spirit, but you can also be fueled by flesh fuel, right? Now, what's going to win the day? The revelation. If you're not consistently bringing your mind to the revelation of Scripture, flesh fuel is winning the day. It doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter where I am on Sunday. Because the heart, beloved, is where the fuel is needed before we ever get to what the body's doing, right? The way the comforter is fueled, the, the, the kindling the comforter uses is the revelation that He has been sent by the ascended Christ to reveal to you so that Christ distinctively gets the glory for your life because you're resting in the truth of the revelation of Jesus Christ and you're glad about who He is. You're glad. The problem in our culture is not only are we no longer exposing ourselves consistently to the Word of God, which is how we find gladness. If you consistently expose yourself to texts that are already even familiar to you, the Holy Spirit will show you things about it. And He'll give you that gladness, that, that sense that Jesus is enough. You can rest in what He says and who He is. And then secondly, we live in a, in a lazy society. I just saw recently... I'm assuming it's true that the public school system is either doing or considered reducing the standard for a, a grade for either a test or school year down to 84% to 100%. A B is 64 to 84. It used to be 94 when I was in school. It may have been higher at one time, I don't know. Why is the standard being lowered? Because the current generation just doesn't want to think, use any effort, right? To be a Christian means to think and to think hard and to give effort. If you have no gladness, it could be because you just don't like to think. We like images to think for us. That's just the culture we're in. We need to understand it. We need to be aware of it. Because to trust in the revelation means to think about Scripture and to experience the power of the Holy Spirit through the Scripture that brings about obedience. And then lastly under this, it's the power uh, or the, the trusting in the revelation in the promises, right? We trust promises. Now back in our text, John 7, or the one we referred to, which clearly is saying, or pointing to Acts chapter 2, the Spirit had not yet been given, Jesus has not been, yet been glorified. Now Jesus is glorified. The Spirit is given. They're glad and they're receiving the revelation of God's Word through Peter, what he said. And now it's happening. We ought to see because of the promises, rivers flowing out of their, their belly, right? That's just a, a word picture for meaning something that is invigorating is flowing from one life to another. Right? The, the imagery there in John 7 is 
uh, living waters as opposed to stagnant pools of water. I think I've told you before when I, uh, another life, I worked another job related to food processing. One of the things you looked at around a food processing plant was pools of water. That was a no-no. Why? Because it breeds mosquitoes, insects, algae, bacteria, and all kinds of rodents that attract. You don't want that around the food processing plant if you're going to eat food from that place. Pools of water don't bring anything out of your heart. But living water, because Jesus is being received by revelation, and we're coming to Him as the fountain of living waters, we're experiencing this gladness, which is a rest in our souls and who Jesus is, and the promises He's given us, because He's ascended, and what now? Rivers of water are flowing out of your heart and life. And where do we see that? Acts chapter 2, verse 44. And all they that believed were together and had all things common. And so their possessions and goods imparted them to all men as every man had need. Now what's happening here? Now these people likely didn't have cash reserves or money in the bank like you and I have where we might be able to help someone along the way. If they were going to help, there was only one way to do it. They sold their excess lands. Whatever possessions they had, and that assumes those that had them. Because many didn't. And they parted to everyone who had need. What was the need? It was a legitimate need. It was like a food clothing need. It was not a smartphone need. Right? That's kind of desire need, right? I think I could live without one. Maybe hard. Don't want to. Probably could do it. Can't live without food. What was happening? The Spirit came. And out of the gladness of their heart, they were receiving the revelation that the Holy Spirit gave them about Jesus Christ. As Peter unpacked just two texts from the Old Testament that nobody would have known what that was about until this day. And now you know it as well. And what happened out of their lives started flowing water. Living currents of refreshing water. Or what's another way we could say it? Just loving God and loving one another. Beloved, the spirit of Pentecost is with us today. Jesus has launched a global mission and every Christian is to be part of it in a local assembly where we're experiencing the centrality of Jesus through the revelation of His Word in all parts of church life so that it starts to produce something, which is the last point under Pentecost. We looked at His coronation. This is the mission now. We see it starting at Pentecost and it just keeps on going to the day we're in because this is to all those that are far off. So the next thing I want you to consider here is giftedness. Obviously, that's one of the first things we think about at Pentecost, right? We see see the sign gifts. We see the gift of speaking in tongues, the gift we would all like to have, right? I'd love to speak Spanish or a ton of languages, but I'd have to learn them, and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that's past now. Spontaneously, when the Spirit came, they began to speak with no prior knowledge of any language, and every man heard them the language in their native tongue. Now, there's three categories of of gifts in the Bible. There's sign gifts, speaking gifts, service gifts. Now, we have talked before how the sign gifts had a moment in time in redemptive history, and they ceased. But what do we see happening here with regard to the other gifts? If you look at the activity of this church, which is found in verse 42, Luke says, this, These 3,000 continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. We don't see anything about sign gifts. Now, they had them in the early church, but Luke does not highlight the sign gifts. Secondly, we don't even see anything about discipleship, so it appears. And yet, Matthew 28, Jesus says, Go make disciples of all nations. So they started making disciples. And God was adding to the church in verse 47, which means they are making disciples, which means they're discipling. But yet, if you look at the epistles, you'll never find the noun form of the word disciple anywhere in the letters of the New Testament. So where is the giftedness here? I'm going to argue it's found in a single word called fellowship. Fellowship. The Greek word is uh, kornonia, fellowship. All right? 
Now, one author makes a case in a book called True Community, Jerry Bridges, that there are two nuances to this word fellowship. One, of course, is a shared, a joint participation in the life of Christ. That's what the word means, to, to share in something. You can hear it in the word used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.9. He says, For you have been called unto fellowship with Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom He's called you into fellowship with Jesus Christ. Now, He doesn't mean just eating a meal in the fellowship hall. Now, certainly, if Jesus were here, we want to do that. But He means you've been called into a joint participation into His life by faith. You're united to eternal life, to Christ Himself. You've been called to a joint participation, even a partnership in His very life. That's how Paul uses it. That's the first nuance. But the second one is horizontal. That flows out of there. It means a joint participation or a partnership. Listen to how Paul uses it in Philippians 1. We would say about the church, always making prayer for you with joy. I'm praying for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now. You could just substitute partnership. Partnership. It was also used in Roman culture as a business partnership. Luke 5.10 Peter, Simon, and the sons of Zebedee were partners in fishing. Meaning what? They had a common goal. With this common goal of catching fish, to provide for family, maybe to sell as a business, they each had tasks they had to complete in order to achieve the goal. Now, those are the two nuances. Now, how do we relate this then to the ascension of Christ? Well, we go back to this Old Testament, Psalm 68, 18. Where there we are told this very thing. Where the psalmist says, Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive and received gifts for men, even for the rebellious. Rebellious means those that are stubborn, Unwilling to be controlled and conform to authority of any kind. Now that includes all of us, doesn't it? You remember when you would not be controlled. You did not love your father's house. You loved afar to roam. But the shepherd sought his sheep. He led you with bonds of love to the fold. Horatio Bonner pins those words that expresses that psalm. So, in that rebellion, how, how does he give gifts to the rebellious? Because he leads captivity captive. He captures the rebellion in their darkness and destruction and then captures them by what? The light and love of his gospel. Amen. And he ascends on high and he distributes in Acts chapter 2 and with everyone, God effectually calls the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, which are signs, speaking, or service. And we're talking about the speaking and the service. Paul confirms this in Ephesians 4, 8. Wherefore it is written, He ascended on high, He led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, Pastors, teachers, speaking, serving in the church. Now, having said that then, how does fellowship relate to discipleship? What is happening with fellowship in the church as it relates to the gifts? And how does that achieve the common goal of a partnership? Thinking about the definition of Fellowship and what it means. So let me give you a definition then of fellowship used here. Fellowship then is a shared relationship in Christ, or in Christ, and with one another where we intentionally help one another toward a common goal of growing or becoming mature in Christ and live on mission for Christ. Okay. What happened when Jesus sat down at Pentecost? He launched a global mission. What did He do? He sent the promise of the Spirit, the gift. What did they experience? Gladness by the Word. What are they doing? Fellowship. 
They are helping one another live on mission and achieve unity and maturity. Now, turn to Ephesians 4. I want you to see this in case you're, you're thinking, I don't see that. Well, let's, let's see how Paul shows us this in Ephesians 4. And that's, that's the verse we just quoted about the ascension of Christ, giving gifts unto men. So here Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 8, I'll read it again. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Then he uses a parenthesis. Verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, Paul puts this parenthesis to showcase the the deity of the Son of Man. Who is it that descended God? Who ascended? The God-Man. So he's referring to the ascension of Christ, the hypostatic union. All the way God, all the way man. All the way man with all the limitations that you and I have. All of them. All the way God with all the divinity and the character and attributes that God possesses. All of all together, not co-mixed, not co-mingled, one person. That's who descended, that's who ascended. Now look at the purpose of these gifts, that He might fill all things. Now if you wrote down Psalm 68, 18, I left off one part of that verse. And I want to connect it here. We're talking about fellowship, discipleship. Psalm 68, Thou hast ascended on high, you led captivity captive, you received gift for men, even for the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Why have you been given a gift, believer? So that the Lord God might dwell among them. But look at what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 10, that He might fill all things. Those are one and the same, but Paul uses a different set of words. See, the aim of our spiritual gifts is that God would so dwell among us as we use our gifts, so that not only are we being filled, but the diffusing aroma of Christ is filling and spreading over a larger area. That's what the word fill means. To diffuse means to spread over a larger and wider area. What does that sound like? It sounds like a global mission. See? Or it sounds like Habakkuk. That the knowledge of the Lord would cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. That, that's a spreading. That's a diffusing. How is that going to happen? Spiritual gifts in the church. Fellowship in the church. Where a shared relationship with Christ and one another is intentionally being lived out so that we're growing in maturity and unity and we're living on mission. We're helping one another stay on mission because there's a million things that can draw us <clears throat> away from the mission, isn't it? All right? One more thing in Ephesians 4. <clears throat> what is this mission? So you've got the speaking gifts, uh, and Paul says in verse 11... Uh, or 12, that's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, there's unity, and the knowledge of the Son of God into a mature man, there's the common goal, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He breaks that down in more detail in verse 15 and 16. We are to speak the truth in love. There's speaking gifts, there's speech. Speaking the truth in love. We grow up unto Him in all things. We're living on mission. We're helping one another stay on mission. And from whom, that is from Christ, the whole body, that's Christians that have covenanted together to be part of a local assembly, from whom the whole body is what? Joined together and compacted by that which every joint is supplying. Compacted means, just think of holding on to one another. Like joints in your body do. What do your joints do? They hold on to one another. Discipleship is fellowship, and fellowship is the shared life in Christ that is intentional. That's a key word, intentional. 
That's why we called it fellowship groups. You can eat there, but that's not the point. It's an intentional effort to grow in unity and in maturity, and thereby we're holding on to one another to complete the mission. What? The filling of the aroma of the knowledge of the supremacy of Christ always, everywhere, in all that we do, regardless of how small that, that footprint may be for us. All over the planet, churches are to be sharing in this common goal. And then finally, look at how this is being played out back in our text. We're talking about mission. When you think of the ascension of Christ, you should think not only of His crowning, but also of His mission that He began at Pentecost, that is also here today for us, although we're years after the event, we still have the promise of the abiding Spirit for this very thing. So what do we see them doing? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The phrase continued steadfastly means unremitting care for doing something. Unremitting means unslackening. And unslackening means what? Not losing your grip. When you don't slack, you, you keep a firm hold on something. On something. They are keeping a firm grip first on the apostles' teaching. They don't have the New Testament yet. The apostles are unpacking what the Spirit was guiding them in all truth. And years later, they would start writing it down for you to have it today. A full revelation of the apostles' doctrine you have on your phone, in your lap, somewhere. That's to be gladly received so we must hold on steadfastly with unremitting care to the Apostles' Doctrine to the degree that we lose grip on the Word of God, then what happens? <clears throat> We're going to lose grip on one another. It's, it's impossible to avoid. When you lose grip on God's Word, personally and corporately, we start to lose grip on one another. But what did they have? Fellowship, which means they had a firm grip on one another. Now that, that's a, an illustration, you understand. A firm grip on what? Pursuing unity, maturity, and the common goal of koinonia, partnership, which is the filling of the aroma of Christ all over Jerusalem, and then all over Samaria, and Judea, and just wherever the church began to spread, all the way to Huntsville, Alabama today. Young person, you don't need to think, what do I do with my life? Oh yes, there are some things still to decide about where you're going to work and who you're going to marry. But, but this main, all-consuming purpose in your life, which is to guide everything, it's how you make decisions under the canopy of seeking God's kingdom first above everything else. And only then as, as a church can we hope to hold on in fellowship to one another in such a way we're growing. Now this doesn't happen. Uh, we'll break up here and we'll get into groups and make sure this is happening tomorrow. No, it's it just something we keep working toward over and over again, right? We lose grip, we have to tighten back up. It's something that keeps going and going with the spirit of Pentecost. And what did God do? He added to them. That tells me that they started filling Jerusalem with the aroma of Christ. How? Not through sign gifts. They had them, or at least Luke didn't highlight that here. But through speaking gifts, apostles were preaching. The apostles were still doing sign gifts. You'll see that in the text, but it doesn't say anything about the people. And through service, gladly holding on to one another for the glory of God in such a way that they were living on mission. Have you lost your grip to God's Word or even to one another in an intentional, deliberate mentality to disciple and have fellowship? And God is calling on us today, beloved, as a church to 
take grip once again. Right? He's always calling us back to the mission because Jesus has been highly exalted. God has put him at his own right hand and he has sent the gift of the Holy Spirit for this purpose. May God be magnified through the spiritual gifts that he's given us in such a way that we help one another live on mission for the glory of God's name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and your grace. And again, we just want to confess our sins. We know how easy it is, Lord, in our culture uh, to lose grip on the word and then to lose grip on one another. And to lose grip on the word, Lord, is to essentially lose it on Christ. So, Lord, uh, draw us back. Help us through this message to uh, have the spirit of repentance and faith. And may we trust in Jesus Christ. May we rest in your finished work through Him. And may we understand the ascension of Christ and the implications of it for church life today and what the Spirit aims to do through us. Through all the ways the Spirit is at work today like He never was prior to the glorification of Christ. And may we find strength in Him and gladness and rest in our souls. Uh, and may rivers flow out of our hearts, uh, rivers of living water, as we bring our, our thirst to Christ and He fills us and uh, quenches uh, the thirst of our souls like no one and no thing can. Be that for us in Jesus' name. Amen.